You ever had one of those moments, uh, one of those times uh, when you felt uh, that you were so much in the presence of God that, that the whole environment around you seemed different? For me, it happens whenever... Uh, I know you're going to look at me crazy when I say this. Uh, for, for me, I know that I'm in a significant moment with God when, when not just the, the feeling around me changes, but I kind of get this aroma. I don't have any real words to describe it, except for it's, it's a sweet aroma. And I, I felt that this morning. Just in the last few moments as I was, as I was sitting and, and, and worshiping and, and praying and thinking, um, God, what do you want me to say? What, what, what do you want me to do? How, how do you want me to, to use your word to touch the lives of your people? And, and part of the only thing that came to me was preach the truth, Trust me and ask your people to seek God through this message. Because here's the other thing that, I, that I've come to, to know over the few years that I've been doing this and the few years that I've been a Christian is, is that if I'm seeking after God, I'm going to find him. If I'm not seeking after God, I'm not going to find him. If I'm focused on things that they are going to keep me from, from being close to, to the creator of the universe, then, then, then I can't help but, but be okay with, with where I'm at. But, but if I'm not, then, then I'm just kind of going through the motions. And, and this whole idea of, 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 the, of revolution has is, is got to be more than, than going through the motions. It has to be more than, than just celebrating something in history that, that Jesus did when he died on the cross and he rose from the grave. It's got to be more than that if it's going to be a revolution. And so that means that every single one of us today, every single day, have a revolutionary choice to make when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just one choice that you made in an altar when you accepted Jesus Christ to come into your life. It's not a second choice that you made at an altar when you asked him to come and, and to sanctify you. It is an everyday choice, a revolutionary choice that we have got to make. And, and, and it's a choice that some people will tell you that you don't, really have to make. It's a choice that some people will tell you that you don't have the ability to make. But the choice is simply this. Will you choose to allow sin to rule your life this day or not? Wow, I got up for that. But it's a revolutionary choice. And, and, and if I ask that question, is sin ruling your life? You are, are likely to respond to that this morning with no. And you might even respond with something like, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't run with girls who do. I'm in a small group. I sang the song. I signed on the dotted line. And there's value in that. There is. <laughs> but it's also true that sin has very little to do with any of that type of thinking. You see, sin is a much deeper issue than what we see in, in an outward appearance of things. You see, sin really has to do with what you give your heart to. 
to sin has to do with, with, with what it is that, that has, has focus of your life. The, the center part of, of your life. And, and, and some of those things can be bad. The whole idea of, 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 of drinking and smoking and running with girls who do all that kind of stuff, that, that, that can be part of, of what we focus on and, and, and the bad part of sin. That, that can absolutely be true. But I think sometimes we, we forget that sometimes sin can just be a focus on anything, whether it's good or bad, that takes the place of, of who God is. You see, sin at its core is not about whether you do bad things or not. Sin at its core is, is idolatry. Worshiping something, giving something a place that only belongs to God. And so when we choose to sin, and we choose to sin, sin doesn't happen just by accident. I think that's the difference. Sometimes we worry about the things. Are there mistakes? Absolutely. That wouldn't be sin. Then when we sin, we, we choose. There, there are moments that we choose to take Jesus off of the throne and place something else on the throne. And, and again, sometimes those things are, are bad, but sometimes they're, they're, they're not so bad so bad. It, it, it's just an unhealthy focus and, and, and it's this, this sense that everything that I do needs to make me happy. We, we live in a world that, that happiness has become the idol. We live in a world where, where, where joy, and not the joy that we talk about that comes from our salvation, becomes what we seek after the most. And so what we'll do is we'll put things in front of God that there may not necessarily be anything wrong with, but whenever it becomes more important, it becomes a sin in our life. So what are some of those things? Well, some of those things uh, could just be attitudes that we hold. Sometimes we hold attitudes about things or ideologies about things. And those attitudes and ideologies become much more important than, than really seeking after God. Sometimes it could be uh, things that are, that are less philosophical. Um, I, I grew up, and I can grow up, I, my first church I pastored was in Colorado. And, and when I was there in Colorado, when, during the interview process, they asked me the question. They said, Scott, um, um, uh, what if, um, you just picture, if you would, a beautiful spring day in Colorado. It's been snowing all winter. It's beautiful out. The passes, uh, everything is melted. It happens on a Sunday. Um, and, and what if nobody shows up to your church on that day and they're all up in the mountains because it's so beautiful in the spring? And uh, my response to that was, well, I wouldn't like that very much. I, I don't think that's probably what God intended. He didn't create us to, to, uh, to worship the creation. He created us to worship him, the creator. And they smiled and they said, that's nice. That's going to happen. I'm like, okay. And sure enough, first spring day in Montrose, Colorado, when it was beautiful, if we had 25 people, that was a good day. And they were gone. It could be things like hunting. Again, I used that out there. First day of elk season, I was lucky if anybody showed up. People were gone. And on one hand, I would kind of laugh about that, and they told me it was going to happen. But in the middle of my chest was this realization that as good as all of those things are, that day they became an idol for people. Sports. 
sports is another thing that we, we, we place on the altar of, of worship. Um, um, spiritual pride could be one of those things. E even our pride and, you know, and, you know and we're 100 years old and still wearing the perfect Sunday school attendance pin. Control of my environment can become an idol. Something as, as simple as a window seal on an old church with a little gold plastic name on it can become an idol. By themselves, there's really nothing wrong with any of those things. There's value in everything, maybe the exception of spiritual pride that I talked about. That would be a negative. But when they become more important than the mission of God, when they become more important than the revolution, it's sin. Well, I thought killing, I thought adultery, I thought stealing, I thought lying, I thought that was sin. Absolutely. Those are the bad things. Those are the things that it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. But I'm here to tell you that there are some things that I've talked about that anything that takes the place of who God is is sin. And the only way to be a part of this revolution uh, of the resurrection is to intentionally love God and other people by allowing God to free us from the nature of sin. You see, I believe God can, can free you. I believe God can, can take away your, your sin nature. It seems like an, an impossible task. That, that seems like it's impossible because, because after all, we're slaves to sin. After all, um, there are some people that say we sin every day in every way. We can't possibly overcome sin. We, we can't possibly live a life where we don't intentionally, intentionally sin against God. We can't do that. Well, the only problem with that is, is that if God can't help us to choose and not to allow, uh, to, to choose not to allow sin to have control over us, then how can we believe in the resurrection? You see, rising from the dead is much harder than keeping us from intentional sin. I have to believe that. You see, sin was defeated and, and death was arrested and, and being part of this revolution is really not as hard as it seems. It's really not as hard as it seems to, to allow God to take away from us this, this nature that we have, this desire that we have to, to sin every day in every way. Amen. Somebody got it. Folks, either the resurrection freed us or it didn't. Either Jesus rising from the dead gave us the, the, the power that we needed. The song, one of the songs that we sang this morning talked about the resurrection power that, that rose Jesus from the dead is in you and it's in me. And we're going to accept sin in our life? It's too hard. <laughs> He's so hot. It's so hard. I want it. I know I don't deserve it. It's so hard and I can't. Yes, it's hard, but it's not impossible. Now, it's impossible for you. It was impossible before the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But now we have the Holy Spirit with us. That speaks to us when, when we're in those situations. And, 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 and what we do is, is we say in that moment, God, I love you more than I love the temptation that I'm facing. And the moment we give in to temptation, we're saying, God, I love the temptation more than you. And we give in. You see, living above the 
not as difficult as it seems. It just requires us to allow God to replace our selfishness, our idols, and our sin with love for God and others above everything else. That's where it kind of gets hard for us. Love for God. Most people are not going to argue with that. I love God more than everything. But love for others. Well, do I have to? Yes. You do. Yes, it's important. There, there is no way uh, that, that you can sin against God or other people if you are focused on loving God. Well, that seems awfully sure. It is. It's the truth. There is absolutely no way that you and I can sin against God or other people if we are focused on loving God and and loving other people. That's the centerpiece of the revolution that Jesus started. It, it is love. It isn't judgment. That is not the centerpiece of the gospel. The centerpiece of the gospel is not power. The centerpiece of the gospel is not um, world domination over all other forms of religion and all other forms of places and peoples. The center piece of the gospel is the love that Jesus modeled for us by his death and resurrection on the cross, by the way he dealt with the poor, by the way he dealt with the sick, by the way he dealt with those who were far away from God. By the way he dealt even with the Pharisees, by the way he dealt with the people that should have known better, by the way he walked into this world as a baby at Christmas. And he began to challenge and change their perceived notions of what it meant to be a God follower. Love God and others more than we love ourselves. That is the revolutionary decision that we have to make every single day. First John chapter 3, starting at verse 1, uh, John says, See how very much our Father loves us. For we for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. See, this is a truth sometimes that we, we get lost and we get caught up in this, this ideology of, of, uh, of, of world domination or this ideology of, 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 of imposing our, our will on other people is, is that we think that the rest of the world who doesn't know God should, should bow down to us because we know God. And so what we do is, is that we begin to, to, to look at the way they live and we begin to, to criticize and we begin to, to twist uh, and, 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 and turn the, 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 the gospel to fit who we are and to make them seem somewhat less than, than what they are. And, and then we're surprised by the fact that they don't recognize God. When John said from the very beginning is, why should it surprise you if a world doesn't know who God is? He says, people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know God. And then he goes on verse 2, dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation 
will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. And so how do we show the world who God is? Not by attacking who they are, not by attacking them personally, not by telling them that they're going to hell even, but by remaining pure, by remaining focused as God's people on God. It's a revolutionary choice. Are you with me? And the reason I'm asking that question is, is this is what, what's hard is we have this, this mindset of, uh, and I can remember singing it, and I, I, I love the song. You know, my favorite song in the entire world was when I was probably, um, pro- I was probably five, was Onward Christian Soldiers. You know why it was the most important one? Is because it was the last song they sang before we left every Sunday. I knew that when we sang that, we were out the door. <laughs> but we have kind of bought into this thing that, that we're soldiers in a culture war. And what we are is we are subjects to the Most High. We are subjects to the Most High. We are not soldiers in a war because we have no power over the world. But God does. And not just a little bit of power, but all power. And so it's important for us to remember that, that, that even when people don't recognize this as God's people, that's not because they're anti-God. It's because they just don't know him. And part of the reason that they don't know him is maybe we're not holding up our end of the bargain. If the people that you work with, if the people that you interact with don't see you as any different than anybody else, that's where the problem comes in. It's not their fault for not knowing him. It's mine for not showing him. And so then we move on to, to, to verse 4. It says, everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. So John's stressing that there is a fundamental incompatibility with knowing God and living in sin. You can't be knowingly doing what you know goes against the law of God and call yourself a Christian. It isn't true. You might convince yourself of it. You might think it's okay. And we might even rationalize it a little bit. But, but what, what we have to do is we have to understand that sin is not compatible with, with, who, with who God is. You see, what John is doing here is he's appealing for obedience. He's appealing for discipline. And he's appealing for consistency in the way that Christians live their life. He's not even talking about non-Christians at this point. He's 50 years after the resurrection. We talked about this when he wrote this letter. And people were even beginning to, to question whether Jesus actually existed. That's, that's the heresy that he was fighting. There were people that were already 50 years after the resurrection saying, oh, that's all symbolism. Jesus didn't really exist. He didn't really die on a cross. He didn't really rise from the dead. And we talked about last week, John said, I said it. <laughs> it was physical. It was real. It happened. And, and so if it was physical and it was real and it was happened, then you and I need to develop a Christ-like character like living like it happened. Verse 5, and you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. See, this is where the power to overcome sin is, 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 is registered to us and given to us by John. It's probably the most important point to be made in everything that I'm talking about today. I'm not telling you something that's impossible, because Jesus already gave us power over sin. 
It's just sometimes we don't want to grab a hold of it. Verse 6, anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Verse 7, dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. And so John is reminding us that the best way to overcome the doubts of anyone is for his people to focus on gently, peacefully, consistently loving God and everyone over self. Any thought that you or I have it is not rooted in the mission of God. It is not from God. Well, I thought this was Family Sunday. It was supposed to be a little easier. And, and I wrestled with I wrestled with it for five minutes. It's like, here we go. See, victory in Jesus is found not in what we know or not even in how we act. It is, it is found in, in how, we, how we love. Uh, I've been around a lot of people over, over my lifetime and who, who uh, talk to me about how much they love God and, and, and then they live in a way that is totally repelling. I had a guy in one of my church boards, I'm not proud to say, it's the only time I've ever had this in one of my church boards, and, and, uh, and he, uh, he really went after me in a church board meeting. It was a small church, um, we were changing some things, he didn't like it. Um, I really felt like God was moving us this direction, everybody on the board thought that God was moving us in this direction, and, and this particular individual didn't, and, and, uh, he got up and uh, across the table from me and just started yelling. And then he even started attacking my, my character, my integrity. This is the first senior pastor I'd ever had. So I was young and nobody else was really dealing with it. And so I stood up and I yelled back. I'm not saying it was my proudest moment, but I did it. And it got really uncomfortable. <laughs> and we kind of went back and forth. And I watched him get mad and leave. We kind of wrapped up the board meeting. I went back to the parsonage 15 feet away from the back door and, and, uh, and really struggled with this guy because um, I, I thought he loved Jesus. We elected him to be on the church board. And the next morning, about 9 o'clock, I'm in my office. And I'm still working through all of this. And, and this guy calls me. And, uh, and I think, you know, we didn't have caller ID or I probably wouldn't have answered the phone, to be honest. And, and so he says, hey, this is so-and-so. I want you to come to my house. I'm like... I don't know if I want to come to your house. So we just had this, this, this big argument. And, and uh, he said, I, I said, he's come to my house. And, uh, and then he said, uh, he said, this isn't about last night. I said, okay. And I went to his house and, and then uh, I sat down and, and he unloaded on me. The mess that his life was. And, and he unloaded on me all of the things that he had placed really on the throne of his life instead of, instead of God. And we worked through it and we talked through it. And then a couple of weeks later, I, I just asked him, I said uh, to him, I, 
I got to be careful. I don't want to say his name. But, but I, can, I can remember I, I asked him, I said, you know, you just, can you, can you walk me through? You just, you, you really raked me over the coals the night before. And yet, for whatever reason, you trusted me enough to pour out your messed up life to me the next day. And here's what he said. He said, Scott, he said, even though I was, I was lashing out at you, I've never seen anything in you in the time that you've been here but consistency. He said, I knew that you were still going to love me. And I, I guess what I'm saying here is, is that, that you and I have to get to a place where we understand that the reason that people leave the church has nothing to do with the things that we think it is. I think sometimes it has to do with our lack of loving God and other people consistently despite everything else. If they're constantly fighting and backbiting within a congregation, even if it's not seen by the larger body, people will be repelled from that church. Because God doesn't trust you as a church with the souls of people who need to grow. when a body of believers can come together and then get rid of all of that stuff they can love consistently gently God and other people more than themselves you can't beat them out with a stick it's the revolutionary choice that every one of us have to make every day to not allow sin to control our life. How do you do that? How, how do you do that? You know, a lot of times when people come to me and during marriage counseling and they, they, they ask me, how do I, how do I know? Um, how do I love my wife? How do I, how do I love my, 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 uh, my husband? How, uh, tell, tell me, what is it that I can do? And, and, and the only thing that I, I know to tell them is, is, is to be consistent. And I ran across this little clip, this one minute, just one minute clip of, uh, of a guy, and, and uh, let's play that clip real quick, and he talks about how... how fell in know? love with you because you remembered her birthday and bought her flowers on Valentine's Day. She fell in love with you because when you woke up in the morning, you said good morning to her before you checked your phone. She fell in love with you because when you went to the fridge to get yourself a drink, you got her one without even asking. She fell in love with you because when you had an amazing day at work, and she came home and she had a terrible day at work, you didn't say, yeah, 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 but let me tell you about my day. Right. You sat and listened to her awful day, and you didn't say a thing about your amazing day. This is why she fell in love with you. I can't tell you exactly what day, and it was no particular thing you did. It was the accumulation of all of those little things that she woke up one day, and it's as if she pressed a button. She goes, I love him. And the same with the relationship. It's not about the events. It's not about intensity. It's about consistency. And so if we're going to make people fall in love with God, it isn't about your knowledge of Scripture. It isn't about how long you've been in the church. It isn't about uh, how many uh, small groups that you've taught. It will be about the consistency of your service to God and others. It will be about looking at that person who is somehow anti-God and saying, you know what? I'm going to be Jesus to that person, even if they don't want me to be. I'm going to take that, that cold glass of, of water. I'm going to write that check. I'm going to spend time hearing from them. I'm going to put aside any of my own preconceived needs and, and desires or, 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 or wants to be, to be heard. And I'm just going to be Jesus to someone. This isn't a revolutionary thought in the church because every preacher that you've ever heard of tells you that. 
but it's a revolutionary choice that we make every single day. And so this morning, you might be here and, and, and you, you may be dealing with this, this, what I'm saying. You may even be struggling a little bit with it because you, you just can't, you can't wrap your mind around it because we're, we're so inundated with all kinds of bad news from, from the rest of the world. Um, um, we're going to go home after this is over and we're going to sit down. Some of us are going to turn on CNN or Fox News and, and, and we're going to let everything that God has done to us or told us in this hour and a half time together, we're going to let it get thrown out the window because they will convince us that we need to be at war with the culture that doesn't know God. And what we really need to be is involved in loving the culture that doesn't know God. Amen? We need to stop being church victim. And we need to be church triumphant. The church that lives as if it doesn't matter what they say to me, it doesn't matter what they do to me, it doesn't matter what they think of me. I'm willing to walk to the cross for them. See, we, we love that Jesus walked to the cross. We love that, that Jesus did all of those things. But if, if we're going to be the church, then then, then we are pretty much called to be Jesus. When we look at this passage, it's, it's pretty clear. And the thing that blows my mind every time I preach something like this is, it is totally doable. It's not always easy. But you, do not have to choose to be controlled by sin in your life. You confess that sin to God, ask for forgiveness, He can take it away from you, and then He can give you the power not to do it anymore. And the best way to make sure that, that happens is, and I said it earlier, is there's no way that you can sin if your focus is loving God and other people to the uttermost. It is not possible for you to sin if you love God and you love other people more than you love yourself. And so as we prepare to come to the table, I'm going to ask those who are going to help to come. I didn't bring my glasses up here with me, so I'm going to do the best to read this. Um, actually, I'm going to run down and grab my glasses. Because this is really small print. I just ran across this this morning when we were talking about what is the, the Lord's Supper. And one of the questions that people ask sometimes is, what is required of us when we come to the table? And the answer to this was this, it is required that we should examine our lives, repent of our sins, and be in love with all people. Not the ones who have done you right, but all people, even the ones that have done you wrong. when you let your need to be loved by other people replace the fact that you're loved by God you're living in sin you can't control other people all you can do is love them With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's take a few moments.
search your heart. Is there anything that you need to repent of? Do it now. Is there anyone that you need to forgive? You've allowed them to have control over you long enough. You've allowed them to separate you from the presence of God. Would you forgive them now? Some of you have lost sight of the big picture. You've been a Christian for a long time. It's not that you don't love God. You do. But if you were honest with him as you've looked, there are some things that he needs to clean up. Would you give those things to him now? Would everyone please stand with me? Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we are thankful that we have the opportunity to come and to receive the broken body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Father, as we have repented, as we have come to you and, and asked for forgiveness, Father, would you make this time a time of affirmation as we receive the broken body of Christ and the blood of Christ. We are an open communion church. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a member here or not. It just asks that you would have repented and prepared your heart for this moment. If you feel like the Lord has freed you to come to the table, would you come? Come now and receive.